Good evening and welcome everyone. For those of you joining us for the first time, we are Science Gallery Bengaluru, a public institution for research-based engagement across the human and natural sciences, engineering and art. Contagion is our fourth exhibition and our first fully online exhibition season. Today's lecture is part of our public lecture series with 23 speakers and is supported by the Indian National Science Academy. We will hear Uma Ramakrishnan speak about biodiversity, humans, and pathogens. Before I introduce Uma, allow me to mention our upcoming programs. An early warning, the story of SARS in 2003 is a lecture by Thomas Abraham on Sunday in the same slot, 6.30 p.m. We will hear on human rights and knowledge during crises, which is a panel discussion with Sanjay Bhattacharya, the academic advisor, uh, one of three academic advisors to this exhibition season. Sanjoy will be in conversation with Se Abimbola and Sharipa Sekalala on Friday, 11 June at 2 p.m. Matter Out of Place, a, master cl a masterclass with uh, Basse Stidkin on Friday, 11 June at 4 p.m. Basse is exhibiting uh, in uh, this season and uh, his exhibit is called Fluid Dialogues. So do go have a look when you have a moment. Uma Ramakrishnan is a senior fellow of the Welcome DBT India Alliance and a professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences. She has spent the last 15 years studying biodiversity and how humans are affecting it. She and her team work across habitats and landscapes in India to investigate biogeography, conservation genetics, and emerging infectious disease. To me, it translates to she follows tigers and has been doing so for the last 15 years. Do remember that you can type in your questions in the Q&A box and do not forget to leave us your feedback because that's what helps us stay on track. Over to you, Uma. Thanks, Janvi, uh, for that introduction and for the opportunity to speak here today. So uh, I'm really excited to share uh, some thoughts uh, that I have uh, with all of you. And I'm going to start uh, by uh, sharing my screen. So I think that, um, what I'd like to do today is to try and break down uh, the relationships between uh, you know, these three concepts a little bit better. We hear a lot about the connections between biodiversity, humans, and pathogens. And uh, maybe what we learn about it from the media is a little vague. Um, and I want to try to demystify this a little bit there's a lot we don't know, uh, especially in the context of India. And I think that um, that's something I'd like to try and come to in the end. Uh, importantly, uh, I think that um, today, tomorrow is World Environment Day. I know these days are like, there's just too many of these days now. But, you know, it reminds us, uh, and I, I hope this talk will also communicate that to you, that, um, the current crisis and the current pandemic we're in uh, is manifest as a medical crisis, as a health crisis, as a public health crisis, but uh, its roots also lie in a much broader um, issue of our relationship with the environment and nature uh, and, and if possible, uh, any balance there. So, you know, biodiversity is a much thrown around term, uh, but what is biodiversity? It's basically the diversity of life on earth. And uh, how is it measured? Because we're trying to be, uh, you know, a little bit uh, quantitative or not, maybe I won't say quantitative. We're trying to, uh, you know, look at uh, causal or correlative relationships in this talk. So we quantify biodiversity uh, in terms of uh, numbers of species. That's how we measure biodiversity, right? That um, we are lucky on this planet to have lots and lots of biodiversity. And again, this is a public perception of biodiversity, the rich variety of species that surround us. From a scientific perspective, biodiversity is measured in terms of numbers of species. And just to, you know, we, we think, if, we, if you think about biodiversity, you would most probably, of course, uh, no idea of how many species there are. This is just one illustration 
um, which is basically 18, uh, 1.8 million species. And uh, you can see, for example, that a disproportionately large number of these are animals, right? Now, I wanted to point out here that uh, we know a lot more about animals. So our knowledge of biodiversity is also dependent on how we study it. And it so happens that larger things, visible things uh, tend to be studied more. Uh, so if you break down uh, animals itself, uh, you can see that um, again, this bias of, of discovery of how we discover species or learn about them shows up again with uh, vertebrates appearing to be uh, the disproportionately high numbers uh, compared to invertebrates. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, very interestingly, basically, biodiversity includes many, many, many species, right? And when we use these sentences, like, you know, zoonoses, and the spillover, basically, of uh, pathogens from uh, animals or biodiversity to humans, um, I think the first question to ask is, what biodiversity? Is, are these zoonoses coming from any, you know, like they are actually uh, these guys, fungi, protists, bacteria, and viruses. And they are mostly coming to us from animals. We don't have zoonoses from plants, right? We don't have diseases or pathogens which spill over from plants to us. And why is this? Because from a physiological perspective in how they are made and how they work, plants are too different from us, right? Whereas uh, in general, animals are more similar. Amongst animals, vertebrates are more similar. And so for example, again, we don't have diseases which spill over to us from insects, right? So insects may transmit diseases to us. They may be vectors, but it's not like a mosquito, a disease which infects a mosquito also a pathogen can also infect us. So when we talk about biodiversity and disease, it's a certain kind of biodiversity we're talking about in the context of zoonoses. It's basically mammals. There are some diseases which come to us from birds. You've, uh, you may have seen recently in the paper about avian flu, but overall, most of the diseases, most of the spillover or zoonoses come to us from mammals. So what are mammals? This is just, again, a caricature of what is called a phylogenetic tree, which is a tree of relationships between all mammals, okay? So you can see, for example, that we are very different from marsupials. There's a human here, and you know they're on very different parts of the tree. However, overall, we are similar to chimpanzees, baboons, and macaques. Uh, and less so to say other things like rats and mice and so on. But still, uh, a large proportion of the pathogens that we get come from mammals. Uh, and in some sense, they are able to infect us because overall mammals are similar to each other uh, and more similar to each other than mammals are to birds, right? Um, that this phylogenetic tree or any other such tree is based on DNA, DNA sequence, which you read and you compare across all mammals uh, and you compare say birds and mammals and you see that the number of differences in birds uh, within birds is less than differences between mammals and birds. And this also correlates with the fact that because all birds have most similar DNA sequences, physiologically, they are more similar to each other. And so a pathogen which enters a bird cell may not do well, say, in a human cell. This is why uh, zoonoses uh, that spill over tend to spill over from mammals, okay? Uh, so I just, I spoke about biodiversity and the units of biodiversity as numbers of species, but how is biodiversity distributed across the earth? So I just love maps and I love this image and I hope you love it too. Uh, this is uh, just a plot of vertebrate biodiversity. This is vertebrates. So 
uh, not uh, insects and stuff. Other animals which have backbones, uh, lizards, fish, uh, birds, mammals, and so on, amphibians. And you can see that biodiversity is not equally distributed. Some places have more biodiversity than others. So I'm trying to build a story here. I hope you're keeping track of the threads. First of all, biodiversity is where we get zoonoses from. We get zoonoses not from all biodiversity, but mainly from, say, mammals, sometimes birds. Okay. Now, this biodiversity of, say, vertebrates is not uniformly distributed across the earth. The tropics or areas near the equator tend to have more biodiversity than other places. If you look, if you, if you remember your geography and you look more closely at this map, you'll see something else that stands out. Mountain ranges, the Himalayas, the Andes, the Eastern Arc mountains in Africa also have lots of biodiversity. And that's a talk for another day. Why is that the case and so on. But for us as students or trying to understand, you know, zoonoses, we need to be concerned about the background distribution of mammals uh, and vertebrates are a proxy for that. I'll show you mammals in a bit, but basically it's not uniformly distributed. Okay. Sorry. So basically then, um, I, I should just add since tomorrow is, uh, is also environment day that this biodiversity provides us many services. So we shouldn't uh, just like exterminate all biodiversity. That doesn't make any sense, right? So we'll get back to that uh, a little later in the talk. Now, what is a pathogen? So a pathogen is a virus, a bacteria, a protist. Uh, protists are like, uh, like the malarial parasite, uh, fungi and nematodes, they're ectoparasites. Um, that can basically cause disease. And how does pathogen diversity then, does it correlate with vertebrate diversity? We'll get back to this in a bit, okay? But just hold that thought that we are talking about zoonoses spillover from mammals. Uh, but what is spilling over from mammals? It is these viruses, bacteria, fungi, and so on, okay? So how we need to also understand how does the diversity of potential pathogens, not all fungi are pathogenic, not all viruses are pathogenic, but how does that correlate with the numbers or the biodiversity of uh, mammals? We'll get to that in a bit. So here, uh, what you see is actually the proportion of zoonotic viruses for different groups of mammals. So you can see that rodents, right, have a high proportion or harbor all rodents, okay, all rodents harbor a very high proportion. The size of this ball is the proportion uh, of zoonotic viruses they harbor. Now rodents also happen to be 50% of all mammals, okay. So if you put these two together, what would you infer that in areas where there is high rodent diversity, for example, there should be high virus diversity. And if you think about it a little bit more, this makes complete sense, right? Because the rodents are hosts for the pathogens, just like habitat for a deer, right? The larger the habitat, the more deer there will be. Similarly, the more the rodents, the more the species of rodents, the more the species of zoonotic viruses, okay? So this is pretty interesting because now we're trying to build these connections and we've gotten just a little bit further. I just wanted to point out one more thing. We talked about the number of rodents, but in terms of the mass, sorry, we talked about the number of species of rodents here, but in terms of the mass, the number of people or the number of livestock, none of these guys, the natural wildlife, bats, rodents, uh, you know, primates, blah, 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 blah monkeys, uh, you know, deer, they don't compare 
humans are super duper abundant very 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 abundant on the planet and also very abundant are cows pigs uh, you know um, horses camels goats and so on because they are associated with humans so if you're thinking from the perspective of the pathogen being able to colonize a human and infect a human is a very good strategy right there are so many of them your resource base your host base just blows up compared to infecting a rat because there are not that many rats compared to the number of humans okay so uh, so just to kind of remind us again zoonoses are transmitted from animals to humans these animals tend to be uh, you know mostly mammals some birds right um, and there are various routes in which this spillover from animals to humans happens okay there could be direct consumption of wildlife that is you happen to eat a bat which has a virus which then gets transferred into your body and infects you or you know that you are while killing the bat the blood of the bat uh, is something you touch and then that gets into your a body through a cut or something like that right um, or you breathe as we are learning from covid you breathe the same air as the bat right you are in very close proximity uh, live animal markets are another place where a lot of zoonotic transmission happens so these are basically uh, what are called wet markets where different species of animals are brought together now this is a new place in the sense it's a new place for those species to be together okay a goose doesn't necessarily see a king cobra it doesn't right because they live in different habitats water birds do not necessarily see snakes or civets or whatever right but when they are all smashed together in these wet markets that's an ideal situation for these pathogens to jump from one species to the other uh intensive wildlife farming there's a lot of farming of wildlife like civets um you know some deer um also i mean even tigers are farmed in southeast asia uh, as well as things like ostriches again these are animals which are packed many many animals packed into small spaces those are ideal conditions for spread of pathogens we've been learning about from covid how what we think of as a nice social a situation where we are socializing and meeting lots of people in close proximity is something which can lead to a large spread or a super spreader event of the disease right so and finally these domesticated livestock so basically you know viruses can spill over from uh, say bats or other mammals to these livestock and then again uh, can come back to humans so there are various examples of diseases which have taken these different routes or routes to come into or spill over into humans but you know this is in general called an emerging infectious disease a new pathogen an unknown pathogen unknown species see once it becomes a outbreak or a pandemic we learn more about it like we've learned about covid-19 the virus which is causes covid-19 is sars cov2 right we've learned about it and we have a name for it but before it was sars cov2 we didn't know what to call it right and only after the genome of this thing was sequenced it was characterized how the disease works then we had a name for it and before that it could just be spilling over locally in a small in some small uh, setting but the difference between that and a global pandemic is not necessarily to do with biodiversity at all right yes biodiversity does harbor pathogens right could harbor pathogens and places with high biodiversity could harbor more pathogens potential pathogens but post spillover the transmission of this and conversion into a pandemic is mostly because of human activities it is because of international travel the high mobility of humans i mean gorillas never leave africa right 
So suppose there's an outbreak amongst gorillas, they'll just be wherever they are and die. However, humans move around a lot. And so they can transmit much more effectively, causing this a pandemic to causing a like an outbreak to become a pandemic. A pandemic is something which is across the world, right? Additionally, animal trade. This is again for um, you know uh, potentially for pet trade or traditional Chinese medicine or other things. You know uh, whatever like trophy based trade. Uh, these things also introduce new pathogens uh, to new places, right? And one of the famous examples is actually of wildlife, where this fungus called chytrid fungus was introduced potentially by a researcher and uh, in his notebook, where he'd gone to study these frogs somewhere else. And, you know, he had some fungus in his notebook. So this, this kind of thing can uh, really, you know, cause large outbreaks. And finally, climate change, again, something driven by humans, where, you know, uh, increasing temperatures, warmer environments are generally better for insects. Uh, and so insect numbers can increase. And a lot of insects are vectors. They carry things like malaria or, uh, you know, things like that. And then uh, they can also spread it much more if their numbers have increased, right? So this is just to show you uh, more kind of geographically that there have been many, many diseases which have emerged. And again, you will see there seems to be a bias again to the, uh, say, say North America. And you, say, you might ask me, but Uma, you just said that there's more biodiversity in the tropics, right? So why are we not seeing more spillover there? This is also a question which wakes me up at night and um, you know, hopefully we'll understand that uh, better over time. But you know, basically uh, human population density, we talked about how humans are so abundant. We talked about biodiversity. And the third aspect is human activities, right? And so these three things are what end up predicting the risk of emergence. So this map shows you then when you combine the number of mammals, the number of humans, the number of species of mammals, the biodiversity of mammals, the number of, uh, number of humans, human population density, uh, the ways in which humans have changed the landscape, uh, how they've modified it, how they've you know, maybe cut forests or not, agriculture and so on, disturbed it. Uh, and uh, like I said, um, wildlife as, uh, sorry, livestock as well, these different factors together uh, increase uh, disease emergence. And so when you look at where diseases have emerged and build a model for where, where is it likely the diseases will emerge, both India and China pop out as very high chances of disease emergence. Um, and basically, you know, like I just said, you have a high chance of spillover when there is high land use change. That is, humans have changed landscapes a lot, uh, high human population density, and high mammal biodiversity. So if you have only high mammal biodiversity, but very low population density of humans, and very low interactions between humans and wildlife, when there's high land use change, or high exploitation, maybe through hunting or whatever, high interface, between wildlife and humans, you will have a high chance of spillover. So here is basically um, uh, just uh, something from some work we did earlier. Uh, I just zoomed in on mammal biodiversity in Asia. And uh, in trying to now think about, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna think more about India, right? So when we think about India, where do we expect to see more mammal biodiversity? and then maybe we can start thinking about, have we seen disease emergence in those places? So there has been spillover in India, right? There has been spillover. Uh, one of the most famous examples is of Nipah, uh, where it was very well contained, and that happened in Kerala. Kerala in the Western Ghats, where there is a high biodiversity of mammals, okay? But you know what? It's very surprising to me that if you look at Northeast India, there's very high biodiversity. 
and I'll show you in a bit, there's also high human wildlife interface, but should there not be more spillover there? So suppose we uh, kind of zoom in on where has there, where have there been emerging infectious diseases in India? And uh, there is a organization called IDSP, which keeps a database of all, like, you know, any report of a uh, emerging infectious disease, right? And, um, you know, uh, my student and so, with some collaborators, we collated, and this is just information for 2019, but we have now done it for many more years. Uh, and basically, we're trying to plot disease emergence in different parts of India. So again, not a very strong pattern. Doesn't seem like Northeastern states have a lot of disease emergence. We definitely see quite a lot in Western Ghats, right, especially Kerala. And by the way, in the Western Ghats, there's a gradient of diversity. That is, Southern Western Ghats has much higher diversity than Northern Western Ghats, okay? But again, you are left with a slightly unsatisfied thing. Is this reporting bias? Maybe people are not reporting if they're sick or they don't know why they're sick. They don't get tested, right? They just, they just recover and they're fine. So, uh, so something which we've been doing, and I wanted to uh, just talk for a little bit about uh, our work, more to uh, not to uh, bore you with the details, but to just think of uh, uh, how much we don't know and how, how can we go ahead with this study? How do you study uh, emerging infectious disease or new diseases, unknown pathogens? Uh, you kind of know that yes, yes, it has something to do with biodiversity. It has something to do with, um, you know, fragmentation or these, you know, landscapes which have been highly impacted by humans. It has something to do with direct interactions with wildlife. So one thing which we are trying is uh, two approaches. One is go to a place where we know there's high biodiversity and high human wildlife interface. And we did this by looking at or studying a bat harvest in Nagaland. And I'll show you a little bit of this uh, in the next few slides. And we also uh, went to the Western Ghats where we actually looked at a plantation. Uh, again, by Western Ghats is a high biodiversity area. It's a biodiversity hotspot, right? And it is the biodiversity hotspot in the world with the highest human population density, highest anywhere in the world. Right. So again, it seems like a good place where we may expect spillover. We wanted to see in these contexts, in these two places where we think we may be seeing spillover, do we or will we or how do we even study it? OK. So uh, in Nagaland, as I said, we've studied bats. And here is just to show you again that uh, you know, this one is a little bit old, but bats have been responsible for several uh, spillover events, uh, mostly viral associated, right? And you know, the thing about bats is, uh, this is a really pretty uh, picture of a bat cave uh, from the central Western Ghats. It's not from, uh, uh, from the Northeast, but you can see all of these little, little eyes are bats. It's amazing that these caves have such high densities of bats. So you can imagine that if you went into a bat cave and if there was a lot of pathogens around, you would be super exposed, right? You would be exposing yourself to all the pathogens these bats have, right? And in fact, there's this, uh, there's this uh, professor called Kate Jones, uh, you know, who studies bats and, um, you know, one of the, one of the, I don't know whether you guys listened to the podcasts I shared, but one of the podcasts I shared was from BBC. And, you know, she says that when she was young, I mean, we didn't know so much about bats before. And she uh, studied bats. Um, I think it was somewhere in South America. She used to walk into caves just with regular clothes. And she had some unknown respiratory disease, uh, which was never diagnosed uh, following being in a bat cave. You know, uh, today, now, when we go and study these caves, we wear full PPE because 
we are scared of any diseases. We know that bats carry many diseases and we think that we might get in something from them. So just to be cautious, just as when you know someone comes to test you for COVID, uh, they don't know whether you have it, but they wear a PPE, they wear protective gear, because in case you have it, they have to make sure that they don't get infected, right? So similarly, when we work on bats in these caves, uh, we do that. So here's the field site. If you can see, uh, it's a really beautiful hilly area in the northeast of India. You can see it's a village called Mimi, and it's very close to Myanmar, very close to Myanmar, very close to the border. Uh, and um, it's basically in the state of Nagaland, of course, in the Kifre district. And uh, here, uh, the traditional people, the Bomer, uh, have been conducting a bat harvest for over a hundred years, okay? And what do they do in this harvest? They basically smoke a cave and bats come out uh, and uh, these bats are, um, you know, sacrificed and then they are then later eaten. And uh, some time ago, uh, we've been working uh, with the, the Bomer. Uh, I wanted to emphasize that, uh, you know, that we have been working with the community for uh, many years now. Uh, and they have our full support uh, in the research we are doing to understand more about this high, you know, high intensity interface between bats and people, right? And early on, you know, we collaborated with Nimhans and we looked at uh, whether these bats might carry something like rabies. And we showed that uh, there was definitely uh, some uh, serological evidence. So this was not genetic evidence. This is uh, you know, a serology test, like an antigen kind of test for something like rabies. We're not sure it's rabies. The tests we can use are only for rabies but we don't really know much about what was in those bats. So this made us very interested to study this system much more and ask about many other viruses, coronaviruses, paramyxoviruses, uh, so many other viruses, which these bats could carry and whether humans were exposed to them. So just to show you that we are very, very careful. Uh, you can see here uh, my members of our team a pilot uh, and Ansil, uh, once it's very, very hard field work because all the bats are dead and uh, overnight they have to set up this tent and basically stay up the whole night, do dissections, uh, you know, take different types of tissue. You can see these are color coded, liver, spleen, kidney, uh, rectal swab, anal swab, blah, 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 blah. So all these different tissues because we have uh, these bats which are not alive, uh, of course, we return the bats afterward uh, to, to community members. We don't, we just take a, just a small bit of tissue. And then all of this has to be transported in cold chain. Why cold chain? All these words are now familiar to you. It basically means cold because RNA, uh, which is the genetic material these viruses uh, we're looking at has, is very unstable. And then it will break down if you just keep it at room temperature. So when uh, the team goes for field work, they have two vehicles and one vehicle is filled with ice because on the way back, all the samples are transported in that one vehicle full of ice, okay? And here's to just show you, especially the detail of PPE, which is worn. We have multiple trainings uh, to make sure that people wear PPE. Now <laughs> it's very common for us to see PPE, but when we started this work, no one really even thought too much about what is PPE and so on, right? I also wanted to uh, emphasize because there's been a lot of discussion about escape of these viruses and so on recently that the way we collect the samples, we inactivate the virus. So we break it up immediately and we are not culturing virus. We're not growing virus back in Bangalore when we bring it back or anything like that. So there's no uh, possibility of, you know, this virus escape or something like that. But those are very important things which have to be specified in a study when it is initially started. Because this is, we know now, this could be a very dangerous thing. Uh, and just to give you a very brief summary of what we found, 
we've definitely found that there are potential pathogens circulating in the bats which are being consumed by people uh, in um, Nagaland. Um, and this tells us, because this was completely an exploratory journey, right? We had no idea what we would find. It tells us this is a high-risk interface and it's a good system to study spillover. So right now we are also doing, uh, we are trying to name these things, right? We are finding things, but what are they? No clue, right? And uh, you had, if you had attended an earlier talk by Chitra, she talked about pathogen genomics, maybe, where you know we can sequence these things. We don't know what they are, but we just read all the RNA, which is in the sample. And then we say, oh, is this bad? No, it's something else. It's virus. Okay, what is it? What virus is it? Oh, it's a coronavirus. Okay, did I get the whole coronavirus? No, I got a bit of it. Okay, there's another bit of it, another bit of it. And piece together the entire genome of these unknown things and maybe then give them names. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that bats are critical to us. We can't just get rid of them. They provide a tremendous ecosystem services. They're pollinators. Uh, they are responsible for pest control. They eat a lot of insects. Uh, and they also are responsible for seed dispersal and the regeneration of forests. So, you know, bats are not something which we can actually live without, uh, really. I need to hurry up, no? Uh, so so I, I'll just quickly go through the second study, which is also in a very beautiful landscape uh, called Kadumane. It's a tea plantation in the Western Ghats uh, in Karnataka. It's about five uh, or so hours from Bangalore. And you can see that these are the Shola grasslands and the forest and this mosaic. Now, what's very interesting here is that you have this uh, high human population density, which is basically people who are working in the labor lines in the tea plantation, living uh, right next to a lot of biodiversity. Uh, just to show you again, pictures of fieldwork because it's always fun. In this case, we're working on rodents and we are looking at a potential pathogen called Bartonella. And here you can see that we catch them with traps and we even put traps on trees because some rodents are uh, you know, live on trees. They don't come down to the ground. In general, rodents don't like open ground. Uh, they have this freeze response when there's a lot of open ground. So we have to always strategically place the traps, hoping that the rodents will come into the traps. So just to show you that this is how this Kadumane landscape looks. And when you see this, you don't need to be a scientist or uh, to quantify anything to say, yes, this is fragmented. You have forest, grassland, tea, abandoned cardamom, all little, little bits abutting each other. And it turns out that in the grassland, there are different rodents. In the forest, there are different rodents and so on. So as a result, you have these different communities living close to each other. And that is, again, pretty much like we discussed the animal market. It's not that bad, but it's a situation similar to that, where different, different species who haven't potentially seen each other through evolutionary time are coming together, abutting each other. And this gives an opportunity for spillover, okay? And I don't want to go into a lot of details, but what we found is that 50% of the rodents in the Kadumane landscape harbored Bartonella. Now, Bartonella is not like, you know, COVID or something. Uh, it, there are pathogenic Bartonella. They cause small things like a scratch, itch, itching sensation, or things like that. So it's not something you might even know you have. It may not be something you recognize as a spillover, right? So uh, here we have not looked at human, the people who live in these plantations at all. But what we found was definitely very uh, interesting that more than 50% of the rodents did have a Bartonella. Now, are these Bartonella pathogenic or is it just Bartonella diversity? They're not pathogens. They're not going to spill over to humans. There's just lots of different kinds of Bartonella because there are lots of different rodents. And this is something which we don't know yet. It's something we have to study, but it definitely becomes significant because there are pathogenic Bartonella and there are humans living in these environments where these rodents are with lots of Bartonella, okay? Uh, you know, the thing is that I've talked to you a lot about 
biodiversity, bats and rodents. And you must be thinking, oh my God, what do we do? Like next time you see a bat, you're going to be scared. I think that what we need to really understand uh, and this figure, I hope it isn't too abstract, but the idea is that there is something called hazard. Okay. A lot of, I mean, bats have a lot of viruses. That is who they are. That is the truth about bats, right? But we are only exposed to it. We only have risk when there's exposure, right? If we are not exposed to those bats for whatever reason, they have the viruses, we go on with our lives and nothing happens, right? Or we could minimize this risk by minimizing vulnerability. For example, if we knew what those pathogens were or the potential pathogens were, and ahead of time, we just designed and kept vaccines or we were monitoring those continuously and we were what's called prepared. There was preparedness and surveillance. Then we could jump in and quickly reduce the risk. You've heard today, everyone, the only thing, the chant is, we need to get the vaccine. We need to get the vaccine. And that is the only way out, right? Now, if, of course, we've done this vaccine, not we, I mean, in general, this vaccine has been uh, created in amazingly short times. Uh, in human history, this has been an incredible achievement. But what if we stockpiled different types of vaccines for different types of potential pathogens and just kept it ready so that if there was an outbreak, quickly you go into that area, quickly vaccinate people and stop it right there. Break the chain before it becomes a pandemic, right? So this, while you may think that breaking the chain requires public health, it also requires the basic science. It requires you to understand the ecology of bats. It requires you to understand the human interface between wildlife and us, okay? So these are new kind of ideas or concepts of how people are thinking about these things uh, in the world as we are all you know, kind of stopping and musing and thinking, what are we going to do? What is the future going to be? And I just thought I'll share with you guys two of the things I'm hoping to do. Uh, I don't know whether they'll happen, uh, but uh, you know, maybe they will. Oh, sorry, before that, uh, this whole concept of trying to understand, you know, like climate change, how it's infecting vectors. I'm sorry about the uh, colors of this, some image from the internet, from a paper, but uh, it's called One Health. And we'll talk about this uh, more uh, in, in our workshop tomorrow. I hope you can attend. Uh, and, you know, it's the idea that, you know, sometimes one thing may not be good for something else. And also so many people need to work together. You don't usually think of a wildlife biologist who crawls into a bat cave working with someone at a public health center. That doesn't seem like an image which really comes to mind very easily, right? The medical people are separate. The health people are separate. Separate Ecologists are separate. You know, people who uh, environmental biologists are separate. But the concept of One Health is that our health is dependent on environmental health and animal health. And uh, we need to understand all of these uh, together. So, uh, so just to summarize before I talk to you uh, for uh, a couple of minutes about uh, what I would like to do. Uh, changing biodiversity patterns are definitely linked to disease spillover. Spillover of emerging and infectious diseases is very important to understand. I know you may feel that this is what scientists always say. They cop out at the end by saying, we need to study more. But we really do. Uh, we really know so little so far. And, you know, the bottom line is, I mean, this is really absolutely the bottom line that conserving biodiversity and sustainable management of habitats so that we minimize our risk is going to be critical. Uh, even for human health, it's not just about uh, some activists saying, oh, save the trees. It's not like that. Uh, even for human health, global economies, um, you know, minimizing infectious disease spread is critical. And this requires conservation of biodiversity. It requires sustainable management of habitats. Like I'm not saying, you know, just let everything regenerate to 
uh, natural vegetation and kill all the humans. I'm not saying that, but we have to moderate how development happens, how habitats are lost, because the minute there is more contact with wildlife, the risk increases. So we have to minimize that risk. One aspect is understanding that risk. What does it depend on? And that's kind of the basic science. But broadly speaking, uh, un conserving biodiversity and sustainable development of habitats is critical. So while, uh, while these diseases spill over from biodiversity, the solution is not to just obliterate all biodiversity. That doesn't make sense, right? It is to understand how to have a balance such that we minimize risk. So uh, hopefully in the next few years, we are going to work with um, you know, many uh, partners in Northeast India uh, to understand you know, these cycles of transmission from rodents to people and also look at unknown fevers and see if we can find unknown pathogens. Um, for example, in states like uh, Meghalaya, there are la large systems of karst caves, limestone caves, where there are many, many, many different bat assemblages, sets of species of bats, you know, and it's really important for us to understand, you know, what uh, are the potential pathogens there, okay? Uh, from a perspective of Bangalore, we are hoping to also uh, work with many, many partners to look at uh, something called, what that we call uh, Bengaluru One Health City. And the idea is that we've seen urban centers, because there is such a concentration of people, are becoming uh, stages for evolution. There are lots of uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, disease outbreak which can be sustained because of the high population density. So uh, this, in this program, we we'll try to understand more about all the different drivers, also incorporate some very practical and new uh, approaches like surveillance of wastewater. So looking for at wastewater to see what are the pathogens which are generally lurking around there. Uh, they're not, you're not gonna get infected from wastewater, uh, that's a misconception, but uh, you can survey the wastewater. It's like a collection of everybody and you can actually look for what might be uh, there, right? Uh, so I'll just stop there. Uh, and um, of course, uh, you know, I um, all the work that I showed you is, um, you know, by many, many people in the lab and you know, so I'm just here to share all of these uh, ideas with you. you know, I'm, I hope you have questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uma. That was very interesting. And it was also good to see glimpses of your work in the Northeast as well as around Bengaluru. So I too look forward to the questions that our audience will have for you. So please do uh, write in your questions in the Q&A box. I'll start with the few that have come in. Um, so here's one. If some species do not see each other, sorry, sorry, sorry. If some species do not see other species normally, which is often due to differing habitats, shouldn't the spillover be tougher due to differing physiology due to adaptation to different habitats? Ah, so that's a great question. And I don't think we know the answer um, very well. But the general uh, idea is that initially there will be spillover. Hmm. Uh, originally, the thought was that pathogens are very specialized to their hosts, that hmm. one particular pathogen only infects one host. But now we're finding more and more that there are these flexible pathogens, which can actually infect multiple hosts. So if the species are very, very different, like, you know, maybe a a rat and a jawbill or something like that. Very diff like not, they're not very different, but overall evolutionarily quite different, maybe. But what tends to happen is there may also be similar species, like two species of rats. Uh, by evolutionary biology, similar species don't tend to coexist because then they would hybridize and you would lose that species boundary. So you tend to have uh, sets of species which could be similar, but you know they're in different places. So, so yeah, so it's something which we need to understand more. How does that transmission happen? And for example, in the, in the example from Kalumane, what we would really need to learn more about is movement. 
right? We just went and sampled from the grassland, we sampled from the plantation, but are these animals moving? Uh, how is that spillover happening? Uh, is something we really need to understand better. So that's something which we could try to look at. Like for example, do you see more similar lineages of a pathogen within a habitat, but very different species versus different habitats, but more similar species? Okay, so that would be how we would try to answer that question. Okay, the next one, what makes bats so conducive for being hosts for multiple pathogens? Yeah, so that is a million dollar question, which uh, <laughs> a lot of people are trying to answer. Uh, but definitely uh, there are some, there are suggestions that, uh, you know, bats, they're hmm. quite small, but they live hmm. quite long. Uh, and there are suggestions that actually flight uh, is energetically very intensive mm. and it produces these things called reactive oxygen species, which are really bad for you. Uh, so one way that bats have solved this problem because they fly a lot, yeah. uh, they could have just burnt out and died very young, but they actually live really long. And one suggestion is that they are kind of immunosuppressed. Mm. Uh, so they don't react to these uh, reactive oxygen species. And this has allowed them to also sustain many viruses within them without being sick. Like they're not, they're not getting sick with those viruses. They do get sick with uh, extracellular pathogens like fungi affect them a lot more. Uh, so there are some trade-off or cost which they pay for this. But these are all things we don't know too much about because, you know, um, a lot of times if you look at uh, biomedical research or lab-based research, it focuses on specific what are called model organisms. Yeah. We uh, do a lot of work with flies, with rodents, with uh, sometimes on humans. Uh, and yet, so we don't understand how these things work in say bats because we've not studied them uh, in the lab context as much. Hmm. So uh, the next question, in fact, anticipates one which I was uh, reserving for later. Uh, with regards to the proposed integration of ecology and medicine, and I think they mean one health, oh. do you have a model for that? How it ought to be? And should the integration be at, you know, while people are getting educated um, in, I'm guessing, uh, medicine as well as ecology? I think that's definitely, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I might end up sounding cynical, but I think our educational systems need a massive overhaul because it's very I'll sign up for that, yeah. box based, you know, yeah. and uh, it, one health is a very integrative concept. And what happens with these boxes, they carry on for life, you know, and, you know, there are government entities which are boxed. Everything is boxed. Ministries Journals, boxed. conferences, Institutes, yeah. the profession. Yeah. yeah. So then, uh, you know, it. I, I mean, I don't know much about medicine at all. And so as a, like, you know, as a scientist, someone might ask me, Uma, aren't you being a little too risky to go and talk about something which you don't know? I, I do know something about ecology. I do know something about evolution, but I don't know about medicine. So I'll have to work with someone else and I'll have to sit with them. And even if they don't understand me, try to explain and try to understand them. So this is sometimes very difficult. So people don't want to do it. What I'm trying to do is really, uh, I mean, this is a personal thing. So it may not be, I'm not saying this is the right way to do it, but I try to build a first uh, relationship like with people I feel I can trust and work with and really trust them and work with people, uh, you know, so that we can work together. Otherwise you can always stay in your bubble and never come out. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you uh, talk about medicine and ecology and, you know, if it's zoonosis and if it's about human interaction with ecology, you need social scientists who understand, you know, how do people live? How do they build relationships to animals? How do they cohabit? How do they not cohabit? Uh, yeah. At what point do they come in contact and why? What causes those kinds of transgressions? I mean, the word transgression itself already establishes the separation of the two, which is untenable already exactly. you know, as 
Exactly. Many ecologists like yourself, but others will already say, right? Like, and so why, why, it's why we continue to work with categories that many, in many ways, don't allow us to capture the complexity of the phenomenon. We are trying to understand, explain, and then act upon it to actually provide a better life for the humans. Medicine, as in, you know, we are seeing in the COVID case, but also, um, to some extent, carry out our responsibility to the planet, right? Like where we are not destroying the diversity of life that has evolved. I mean, um, it's a, it's a, I mean, you know, at, at Science Gallery as well, but also myself as a historian of science, I mean, what I've, what I've experienced um, resonates, you know, hugely with what you've just said, which is that we sit in our boxes, we carry out our professional responsibility in boxes, which is research, teaching, uh, publications, conferences, um, awards, rewards, everything, you know, is tied to being well behaved and following. Exactly. The plan. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's incredibly counterproductive, yeah. because it doesn't allow us to understand basic phenomena. And, you know, I mean, this is something a pet, a pet peeve of mine, I will come to the question. Uh, the next question is that, you know, increasingly, what I find is that in the name of interdisciplinarity, there is also a huge thrust to replace knowledge making or knowledge production or research with problem solving, mm. right? And they are not the same thing. I mean, and we are trying to reimagine education, not just in India, elsewhere too, trying to reimagine education as if problem solving was the best way to produce knowledge, as if knowledge was in the service of problem solving. And quite frankly, I mean, uh, there is value for industrial research, there is value for clinical research. There's, so there is a place and space for problem solving, but it's not a replacing idea for knowledge production. It's not a replacement for research. And I'm, uh, I mean, uh, I was wondering if, you know, following from that, uh, uh, could you sort of explicate a little more on the idea of One Health? Because, uh, you know, you quite clearly sort of have bought into it, you're leading, uh, leading sort of an important effort in the city in thinking about it. Could you share a little bit more about that as well? Yeah, so so basically, I think especially the effort that you mentioned, Janvi, in Bangalore, which we're just really, is just a concept uh, mm -hmm. right now. We're not, uh, we're just talking, uh, is really trying to bring, uh, you know, uh, public health, you know, unknown pathogens, pathogen discovery, uh, you know, including, uh, you know, studying animals and where they're distributed, how those distributions are changing, but all that is still data, right, or information. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to actually, as part of that, have a very strong component of communication and building uh, synergies. Because, you know, the thing is that sometimes, you know, what the wildlife biologists might want, which mm -hmm. is all the birds to come to all the lakes, might be... Uh, not something which someone from a public health perspective may want, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, what happens is they would never just speak to each other. So mm -hmm. I'm very, I feel very strongly that what is going to be the real challenge is also the communication. Yeah. Uh, maybe ways in which we can think of how can people even understand this? It's a very difficult concept, right? <laughs> that climate change, oh, why would it affect health? It just seems very, health is very personal. Climate change is like temperature or whatever, right? So I think that the first thing would be to even uh, create materials which help people understand these connections and internalize them. And then, uh, you know, provide potentially, uh, you know, data and evidence and predictions yeah. which can be actually mainstreamed in decision-making. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, you know, how does the layout of the city actually affect risk? We talked about those risk maps, which are global. Can we create those risk maps at a very, very um, small scale, small spatial scale, right? And then can that information be incorporated into planning the city or planning, say, wastewater uh, and so on? So, I mean, I think, I don't know whether that answers your question. It's still very uh, nebulous, even in our minds. But I think it's something which we have to start the conversation uh, and see how far we can go in mm -hmm. terms of both engaging with the public and also in terms of uh, getting government agencies to talk to each other and be on board 
that this kind of an interdisciplinary program is important for to be cognizant of. Mm. No, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think this conversation really needs to begin in the first instance yeah. with people who hold the ability to produce knowledge and why their knowledge might actually nestle or not nestle against each other easily. Like you said, conflicts of interest in terms of how you know urban life is organized, and and likewise for you know non-urban life. You know, we've 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 seen very important and good work come out about say uh, elephants and um, farmlands and things like that, right? Like, and so how does one understand urban ecology? Yeah in relation to several questions that you spoke about. So, uh, so I think that's a, that's a good hook and we might come back to it, but I'll, I'll uh, look at the questions that have come from our audience. Uh, one is a very optimistic question. Can we learn from bats about immunity and apply something similar to us? What kind of a study would that be? So I think that, for example, there are some studies going on now with a bat cell lines mm. uh, where they're looking at, they're looking at this cross infectivity uh, so taking different coronaviruses, say, and seeing, does this coronavirus infect this bat? Does this coronavirus infect that bat and so on? Mm. So you have to start at that level of cell lines where it's just bat cells. Doing infectivity experiments with real bats, with uh, live animals is something, again, uh, it hasn't been done much, uh, but it's something which, I mean, basically their approach to immunity is a bit different. Uh, so we can't change our, you know, hardwired approach to immunity, but we can probably learn about uh, infectivity or some such thing, like what is potentially more infectious to human cells and why uh, with these things. So even, for example, what we see, uh, we always think like, you know, how could we have stopped this variant, these variants which have evolved? Hmm. Actually, I don't know if it's possible because what happened was evolution, right? You cannot stop it unless you do. I mean, of course, there were some things which promoted it, like the mass gatherings and so on, allowed that to happen, like explode. But it's unlikely that, you know, I mean, it, it, it did happen. So um, whether we could have prevented it, mm. uh, apart from behaviorally, biologically insight could have prevented it. I don't know. Hmm. Now that's an interesting uh, uh, I don't know that's my opinion <laughs> yeah yeah no but it's an interesting one to run with right and and we can also you know speak to other uh, people who you work with don't work with etc and you know how they might actually think about it but it but it's an important distinction to draw which is one is to just stop the spread and the other is to actually think about how do variants emerge and therefore do we have any um, you know, is the, do we have any say, or do are we able to intervene in that process at all? I mean, I mean it's, an, it's a it's an organism trying to survive, right? Like yeah, and basically there is so many humans, right? Yeah. So yeah. there's like ample room for evolution. Yeah. So there's another one again. I, I find that interest. I find this question also interesting. Migratory birds might also be carriers, but how is it that locations such as Rajasthan and the Himalayan region? Uh, see less novel outbreaks. Um, and this was uh, to our viewer, um, visible in the slide. Yeah, I uh, showed the data from IDS. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know the answers. The thing I feel like there's a lot of reporting bias uh, in those mm -hmm. IDSP reports, but okay. definitely um, migratory birds, this, the, the spillover is usually something like avian flu, which we haven't had. We've had spillover to poultry but they've mm. not had human cases of avian flu, right, uh, in India, uh, so recently. So mm. basically, uh, this is not something which would be reported in IDSP. Mm. IDSP is only human uh, infections. True. So for example, that's again a gap, right? The, the animal husbandry people are not talking to the human infect, like uh, human uh, medical people, True. infectious disease guys. So that whole thing needs to be kind of uh, integrated somehow yeah yeah i mean i uh, uh i don't have much to say to this but a little bit uh, so i have a sibling who uh, works in fact in climate change and health and she looked at um idsp work in maharashtra so all all uh, primary health care centers and the uh, and the in 33 districts uh, so she studied that over several them over several years and one of the things i remember her discussing is that you know one one also needs to kind of 
have the same degree of caution of IDSP data as we have with other data coming out, which is, and this is not to suspect malice or anything of that kind, it's just the ability of the primary healthcare centers to be able to send data when it's relevant and when it's fresh and, you know, computers, electricity, um, things that are so basic that, you know, you're asking questions like, was it reported on time or was it fresh? Did they identify the zero, whatever case, etc.? become sort of side questions like one can they do it do they have more than one person in the center can they have the time to fill that extensive form do they have electricity for the time when they are able to do it you know i mean do they have to visit people at home yeah data missing age not known i mean it's so many complicating factors that you know one, one should also look at the idsp data i think um like with the same degree of caution as one would look at any other uh, data yeah. given to us yeah, that's a great point you bring up. I just wanted to bring up two additional points. One yeah. is many people, if they're sick, may not even go anywhere. Mm -hmm. For example, in the Northeast and all, a lot of people, they're, they're like the village we work in, Mimi, yeah. in Nagaland, for 10 years, no doctor has gone there. 10 years. Wow. Okay. So there's no, uh, I mean, even if there was some, there's no reporting or anything, right? That's one thing. And the second thing is that, uh, they may not be able to detect what it is. So a lot of these tests of, okay, it's this disease or that disease are based on serology, yeah. based on antibody tests um, for known diseases, mm. right? Mm. And they may be unknown things. Yes, yes. So I, I personally feel like we keep talking about this patient zero. Yeah. I think there was minus 200 or whatever. I'm... I don't know, but maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we don't know. spill over many times and it just didn't it didn't like explore. Yeah. But um, so that's what we're hoping to do in the Northeast project, where we are going to work with uh, you know public health practitioners uh, to actually work in areas where there is a high interface with animals, wildlife, hmm. and uh, basically work with healthy people hmm. who may be asymptomatic or may not, they may be exposed. Uh, but if we can catch uh, that exposure, yeah, uh, we can like jumpstart our understanding versus the reactive way in which we are now working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whatever we're doing is very reactive. Yeah. So the hope is, if we understand more, we can mm. be preemptive. So I think you, in a way, anticipated a question that has just come in. What if the phenotypic expression of diseases by pathogens is not prevalent enough to be detected? Is there any chance of breakout over time? And how do we identify the spillover before it gets hazardous? So that's what we are trying to do. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know how well it, again, it works. I mean, if it's a completely unknown thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then, so how are we going to uh, say, suppose I said, we're going to try to detect exposure in humans. So mm -hmm. the way we do this is again using uh, some kind of a, you know, it's, a, it's like a, a cheat uh, antibody test. Like you can call it an antibody test, uh, but we are not doing antibody tests of people who are sick. We're doing antibody tests of everyone. Uh, and if it is something which is similar enough to COVID-2 or similar enough to something else, it may not be the exact same thing, but mm -hmm. you'll get an antibody reaction, right? And mm -hmm. then you can, from that person potentially, uh, and maybe from the bat or whatever, if you get some genetic material, mm -hmm. you can say, ah, I have an exposure to a coronavirus. I have a sequence of a coronavirus. This coronavirus can potentially spill over to humans. Mm -hmm. I may sequence many other coronaviruses from those bats, but I may not, you know, it may not be spilling over. Bats have lots of coronaviruses, right? So I think that this is the best shot we got. I mean, we may not still detect it, but that's what we're going to try to do. Let's see. Let's see what, what happens. Yeah, no, sounds, sounds interesting. And like, you know, okay, what's going to happen? <laughs> uh, there's, there's a, the next question, I'm not entirely sure if, uh, you know, uh, should be directed to you, but I'll present it to you and you can choose how to answer that. Uh, there's a new strain of bird flu in China. Do you think it is a cause of concern? Yeah, you know, so bird flu is a cause of concern in general. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been waiting for a long time for a, uh, you know, uh, influenza 
outbreak because influenza as a virus is super dynamic. It can change very fast, uh, you know? And so um, I think though that what has saved us so far is we've not had human infections. We've had a lot of poultry and there's a lot of economic loss with poultry getting infected. And again, because they are, you know, boxed into high density settings, lots of them get infected. But um, yes, any emergence is a cause of concern, but I think it should not be a cause of panic. Um, we need to look at, you know, what's happening. And of course, it is important to report. Hmm. See, this is a line we have to be careful of, right? We can't not report it because that's hiding information. Yeah. But if you report it, you don't want people to go completely scared. Yeah. So we have to study it and understand the transmissibility and other things. That's where the virologists and hmm. others come in, right? I can't study transmissibility. I, I don't know how to do it. But you know, you have to infect, say, uh, human cells with this virus and see how well it replicates inside human cells. Mm -hmm. And then you can understand about transmissibility and think how infective uh, humans might be. So you'll have to do those kind of studies and then maybe build some models uh, and then think about how in, what, an, in, what impact it could have. But definitely containment and all that has to be immediately you know, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, that. That's why often they will kill poultry a lot of like the yeah, example yeah, yeah. with the minks, minks, yeah, in, yeah, in Netherlands where they were killed millions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that um, you know, unfortunately, we do that when it comes yeah. to uh, humans uh, yeah. and human health. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question we have is from uh, uh, is again about. I think it's a related question, unless I'm completely mistaken. How do we know that the virus may or may not spill over? Is it about, is it just comparing how closely the species are related evolutionarily or is there something else? No, I don't think so. I think that's a very difficult yeah. question to answer. And, uh, you know, for example, if you look at say um, coronaviruses, there's a spike protein, you know, which mm. allows us, uh, allows them to enter human cells. And mm. there's in that spike protein, there's a receptor binding domain, the bit of it, which attaches to the receptor and goes inside. Mm. And, um, if you look at uh, coronaviruses, that particular bit is yes. very different between coronaviruses, depending on which species they infect. So you could make some predictions based on uh, mm. how closely related spike proteins are to each other or some mm. such thing. Suppose you discover some new coronavirus and you want to say, will this infect humans? Mm. So you could, you could say, okay, uh, the ideal spike protein to get into human cells should mm -hmm. have this sequence or this structure mm -hmm. and how close is the unknown one to the best one that we know of or something mm -hmm. like that. So those kinds of things, just like we are now saying, oh, this mutation uh, in the, uh, you know, um, receptor binding domain leads to this uh, or this other mutation leads to immune escape in the COVID-19, I'm sorry, SARS-CoV-2. So mm -hmm. we can try to do that. And the thing is, but I'll tell you uh, something. I, I, I might be wrong again. This is my opinion. But I think that our knowledge is still very low. Like, so for example, if I find a new species of rat, say, hmm. actually, I know a lot about rats. And I know uh, there's a lot of studies on rats. There's a lot of genetic data of rats. And hmm. so to, to tell whether it's new or not is very easy, relatively speaking. Okay but we know very little about viral diversity. So mm. we won't probably know enough uh, mm. and it will take a while before we know enough. And mm. there's, for example, a program called the Global Virome Project, much mm. touted, an effort to just sample viruses right. across the world mm. uh, and just catalog them. And a lot mm. of people get upset. You know, like, what is this cataloging? Why do we need to catalog? But you know, the bottom line is these catalogs, they become the databases which we yeah. search. For example, if no one had sampled that rhinolophus bat yeah. uh, and gotten that coronavirus sequence, we wouldn't know the closest relative today, right? Uh, it happened to be there. That data happened to be there. They didn't do it after COVID. It just mm -hmm. happened to be a sampling, which they did, ecological mm -hmm. sampling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, classification is fundamental to science, right? Like, I mean, how would we understand speciation or species yeah. or 
anything at all unless yeah. you map it i mean linnaeus's work yeah newton's work to some extent i mean you the founders of modern science were basically people who sat in wunderkammers and what be later became museums of the world collecting species from across the world and classifying oh, yeah. them right i mean it's 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 fundamental i mean you know as a student of science we look at it critically also and how you know uh, in a sense it divides the world how how it and but there is also some there is there is also something fundamentally sort of um, important to that function right like so how i mean to in many ways it, it's almost impossible to imagine why you would not want to know how many viruses are there and how one might actually understand the landscape of viruses uh, in order to progress in in any which way at all i mean how do we understand plants how do we understand insects how do we understand animals without that kind yeah. of mapping yeah so i'm so mindful one of, small yeah. point to add this yeah, now, there are lots of there are uh, several people proposing uh, you know uh, artificial intelligence machine learning basically approaches yeah. but when you have enough data to mine uh, yeah. you know can you then start trying to predict which virus is more likely to be pathogenic or not of course one ultimate test would be to try to infect uh, say cell lines or cells with those viruses like we discussed um, and of course uh, you know the classic uh, you know in uh, pathogenicity tests would be uh, you know culturing and allowing it to culture and so on coach's principles but we can't do that in many cases because many things are not culturable they we can sequence things we get access to their genetic information yeah. but we don't have the organism mm -hmm. you know we mm -hmm. may not have the bacteria the mm -hmm. whole bacteria which we can grow mm -hmm. it may not grow yeah because we don't know how to grow it but we can access its genome mm -hmm. so with those genomic information mm -hmm. it's possible with lots and lots of it maybe we can try to develop some analytical methods to Uh, hmm. do this better hmm. so clearly lots needs to be <laughs> lots of work ahead but that's also i think exciting and i hope there are some young and early career researchers in the audience who will find this exciting and want to take it ahead i'm aware that we are at 1950 and uh, uh uma has a has a tutorial session ahead of her uh, for those of you who are not aware we have we usually have the speaker spend an hour with uh, our young audiences with a preset reading uh, where they then have a more uh, calm exchange uh, with the scholar and get questions answered that they might have been either shy or uh, you know couldn't ask in the public lecture or also questions about you know careers and choices and things like that so we look at it as an opportunity for an intergenerational conversation and so uma must get at least a short break before she uh, enters that session so um for those uh, yeah for those again joining us for the first time the recordings of all our lectures are uploaded to our youtube channel so in case you missed any of the previous lectures or if you want to share uma's lecture with your friends and colleagues and students do check out our youtube channel uh, i'm absolutely sure you enjoyed this lecture so do explore the exhibit putting ants into antibiotics by the john ns center people at the john ns center it's it's really i find it very very fun to watch ants crawling all over the screen uh they are real and it's a live feed um uh, consider signing up for uh, a, another public lecture by michael brezalier on sunday 6 june at 1:30 pm he is going to speak about contagion across species global histories and ecologies of zoonotic diseases so a historical perspective uh, from the archive on stuff that uma has spoken about today um you might want to sign up for a workshop if you are in the young adult uh, age group on decoding one health which is tomorrow 5th june at 2 pm by the echo network of which uma is an important part and bengaluru one health uh, uma along with her colleagues will be facilitating this workshop Uh, another recommendation i can make is uh, do consider watching a film we have on our exhibition website which is called where birds dance their last it is by the vietnamese filmmaker lena bui which follows farm workers in north vietnam where duck feathers are collected and exported to china so you know it's about hu uh, human and duck cohabitation and the kind of situations it creates including that of fear of disease um do give us your feedback to register for our future programs and of course do visit the exhibition website so 
last but not least, thank you so much, Uma, for taking the time to be with us this evening and for the engaging lecture, but an even more engaging question and answer session that um, you have um, you know, spent time on. Thank you and thank look you. forward to future conversations. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for taking the time. Bye.